Good morning, everybody. Right when I say welcome, whoever is coming in the door, welcome. All right, thank you. Um, I know most of you, but I met some new people this morning. My name is Ryan Scott, and I am privileged to be a guest here this morning to be leading in worship. And I always enjoy being with Church on Main, and it's wonderful to see everybody out. And the air conditioner seemed to be working, which is a wonderful way to begin. Um, I love that I've been given the task of doing announcements, which I don't know any of. So if anyone is aware of an announcement that needs to be made before we start, please share that. That's right. We're less than a month away from the Peach Festival, right? And there's going to need to be helpers. Do we know who to contact if you want to help? I would contact Brooke. All right. Yeah, I mean, I think the detail is, it's, yeah, just, we're looking for looking for interest right now. Interest, yeah, it's just based here. Just let people in and out to use the restrooms, all the tables, information. I'm um, going to give out copies of ice cream and server, things like that. So it's going to be like an all day thing, but we want to sign up for hours. We want to see who's interested to help us out. Sure. Church on Main is always a wonderful, cool place to go on Beach Festival Day, so we don't have everyone passing out like has happened in other years. So that's great. Well, let's begin uh, with our call to worship. I'll read the, the plain text, and we can read the bold together. Family of faith, this must be the place. This is the place for connection and growth for me. This must be the place for questions like, where are you from? And what do you need? This must be the place because all belong here. All are welcome here. All birds and joy, needs and prayers, dreams and love are welcome here. So for our call to worship today, we're going to lean into invitation for connection. God is near. Let us worship holy God. Andrew's coming to lead us. This song is a newer song. I haven't played this song um, in probably, I, I don't know how long it's been. <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, you may have heard this before. But this comes straight from many years ago when I was very involved in uh, leading worship. And, uh, you know, some of y'all know a little bit of my story, so. Uh, before the world was me, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings, yeah, you were, yes, you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name. All my days, all my days, so let my whole life be a blazing offering. A life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Save my life and let it be all for you, for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all 
for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. And we sing glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to you, God, forever. Glory to you, God. Glory to you, God. Glory to you, God, forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. We will continue our worship with a time of prayer, um, a practice here that we pray together. We share our requests and our celebrations, uh, and for the joys, we respond together, thank you, Jesus. And when there are requests and petitions, concerns, we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Are there prayers that we can begin to pray together? Prayers to uh, Susan. Uh, her mother is going to hospice tomorrow. Her dad's already in the hospice. I'm going to take me to my daughter's hospice before she dies. Susan's parents, both of them. So for Susan and her family, especially her parents, we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Um, I have some prayers for Thanksgiving. I have a uh, Thanksgiving for the angels singing behind us because it's just an inspiration. <laughs> I feel like I can sing louder because they sound so loud. So I, I'm enjoying it already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then I have uh, two celebrations of life for my niece's birthday was yesterday, and my son, that was who also celebrated his birthday yesterday. Um, I was able to spend time with him in Cleveland and got to do some adventures and uh, I got to drive back here to go back to Wonderful. <laughs> we say, thank you, Jesus. Thanks a lot. Also, a birthday celebration. My eldest daughter is five. <laughs> <laughs> On Friday, and, um, we, Peter and I went down to join her and one of her children is son, Martin. We had a lovely time. It's really, really special. And, and I just thank God that she's in a good place right now. Mm -hmm. For Lisa and her life, we say, thank you, Jesus. Yes, uh, I'm going to have some prayers for um, my my niece is disabled. She has two disabled children, and now her husband um, is in, in intensive cardiac care. Um, he's in so bad condition that they can't even operate. So his heart is only now functioning at twenty percent. So just prayers on how they can be able to fall back now. I don't know how they're going to function. Just prayers for the whole family. And family, we say, Lord, in your mercy, in our prayers. I mentioned to some of you this morning that our my parents have moved in with us the first week of July. And while I was excited about that, I was also like, okay, what's this going to be like living with your parents? But um, two weeks ago now, 
I we all got COVID and it's our first time. And I was really thankful actually that I had my mom, especially my dad, making sure that like we're all okay. So it's been a blessing to have in our sickness help with you know being all together. So I'm thankful. It's not a fair question. So we're on the meds and thankful for them. I cleared everything with Brooke before I came. We met all the protocols. But we do say thank you, Jesus. So now that Caitlin has introduced me, I'm starting a new job on Thursday as a hospice chaplain. And um, you know, hospice chaplains aren't always Christians. And obviously, we need to serve each of faith. And I'm happy to do that. It's a privilege to meet people wherever they are in their faith journey and, and, and light to them. And, and so I would appreciate the prayers that that's exactly what can happen. We say, Lord, in your mercy, in our prayers. I'd like to offer uh, many, many prayers for celebration and gratitude for my daughter. Daughter, daughter, settling camp too. Not like the way I said that. <laughs> Drove her to Kansas. She is settled. She's actually in California. We're in right now. And then I just got to go to North Central Northwest. We saw so much of that flora out there. It is absolutely gorgeous. And like in the seventies. So. Say, what is the heat wave? wave? Yes. I want to go back. <laughs> we say thank you, Jesus. So many blessings. Anybody on Zoom that might have a? I'm not sure. There are seems to be somebody signed in. I don't know if there are any prayer requests or praises. It look like Same thing thing anybody has. If there are, we will say both thank you, Jesus, and Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We know that they are lifted. Everywhere and at all times, as the Spirit moves. Let's uh, let's pray together as we move towards our time of Scripture and sharing. Heavenly Father, we lift up again all of these requests and celebrations, these joys and sorrows. We thank you for the great diversity of experiences in life, and we thank you for this community of people that you've called together in this time and this place to be your people. We ask that all of your grace and your mercy would fill this place and we would feel your presence, especially in this time, that we would be open to the leading of your Holy Spirit, that we would be changed and transformed into the image of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. So I don't know if I'm unique um, as a writer and as a preacher, I often like being given an assignment. So I asked Brooke when she asked me to preach if we were in the midst of some sort of series, and she's always gracious to say you can step out of that if you want to, but I enjoy the, the challenge of that. So we've been given two passages and a very specific question, what do you need this morning? And the first uh, passage that I'm going to read is just a couple verses from Job, Job chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. And I don't know if I'll have the same version that's... Uh, with you, but we can follow along together. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. And then also we're going to read from 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 9 through 18. These are Paul's personal remarks at the end of the letter. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me 
and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander the metalworker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through the message, though the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you pray with me again as we reflect on the scripture? God, we just ask that you would add your blessing to the reading of this word, that it would be active and alive in our hearts and minds, and that we would take it with us on our tongues and in our hearts as we read this place. In Jesus' name, amen. There was uh, a woman called Sarah, that was her name. Well, not really her name, it's the name I'm using, so we don't identify her. She had the life that almost anyone would aspire to. She had a really good job, and this charming fiance. She was organized, dedicated to her work. She also had a ton of friends and an active social life. She was, she was the kind of person that everybody came to um, when, when they needed something. They all looked to her for support and encouragement. And this life uh, made it all the more difficult when she found herself sitting in a psychiatrist's office, not sure if she wanted to keep living it or not. Everything that everyone saw was a facade. Growing up, her father had been an addict and was abusive to her, and that, that created a, a feeling of inadequacy in her life. And later on, that was compounded. She was a, a dancer, and one of her coaches was constantly picking on the way her body looked, and she developed a, a, an eating disorder from that. And her mother, meaning well, but having been burned by her own relationship, was encouraging her to marry the right kind of guy. And she found someone who looked the part, but didn't act it, manipulative and selfish. And the pressure she felt from trying to maintain this life that she thought everybody expected of her nearly killed her. And no one knew it. It was completely silent. And that's just one example. I think we can probably identify with some of those feelings from time to time. And we feel pressure to be something maybe that we're not. One way to look at it is that we're all at the bottom of some deep, deep hole. And we might look over at somebody else and think their hole is a little bit deeper, but does it really matter if neither of us can get out, right? We're all incomplete in some way. We're all needy. We're all broken. We do not have what it takes to get out of the hole we find ourselves in. And we'd like to think that it's possible, right? We hold up other people's successes. Maybe people held up Sarah as someone who seems to have found their way out of the hole, someone who got it all together. And we hold those people up to give ourselves hope that maybe we can figure it out. And that's why I think it's especially tough to hear some of these words from Paul. Now, I suspect he didn't intend everyone for the next 2,000 years to read these personal remarks that he put at the end of his letter, right? He was probably just intended for Timothy. All the friends and the co-workers who had deserted him, the ones who hurt him, this record that we have for all time of how much he, he felt need and, and this desire for companionship, for assistance, we don't like finding out that people we respect are maybe not as capable as we hoped that they would be. Everybody is at the bottom of a deep, deep hole. But I think at the same time, Paul's private words can, can really be good news for us. This vulnerability, as much as our society doesn't like it, is very important. We're, we're taught to be self-sufficient, right? We're taught that that apologizing is a weakness, that relying on others is some sort of burden or deficiency. That's the, the, what our society tells us. And for some great hero of the faith like Paul to be at the end of his rope is important for us to hear and know. 
Now, as much as we have sort of taken in as being residents of the United States, this rugged individualism that we like to, to tout, we can never escape the reality of our humanity, which is that we were not designed to be alone. Some animals work. It seems that mountain lions are perfectly designed to walk around in the woods all by themselves for the rest of their lives. That's how it works. But we are not mountain lions. We are pack animals. We're a herd. We are designed to be together. We're a lot more like prairie dogs, right? Incredibly vulnerable on their own, but in mass numbers, they're pretty safe. We need the group. Our world is trying to fit us into a box that we were never intended to inhabit, this self-sufficiency, this individualism. We don't have to be all sufficient or capable of everything or complete even because we're not intended to be. We're intended to be in relationship with other people. We're part of a larger whole. When in the book of Genesis, it says we're created in the image of God, well, we believe God is a trinity, three in one, distinct persons who are so intertwined with one another as to be inseparable. That is the image in which we're made, or at least it's supposed to be how we live, right? And I think we see little bits of this when somebody dies, right? The casseroles show up, the lawn gets mowed, the mourners are there. It's what we see in those brief verses from Job, right? All of his flocks and herds are stolen or destroyed. And, and as he's dealing with that trauma, the news comes that the house that his children were eating in had collapsed on them and they all died. Everything in his life is gone in an instant. And his three friends drop everything and they show up. And it says they sat for seven days and seven nights and said nothing. They just sat and waited with him. And I think we're pretty good about recognizing when someone's hurt. I do think we can do that pretty well. We see someone down in that deep, dark hole, and we realize it's time for us to climb down in there with them and spend some time. And that's when we experience true humanity when we need other people and when we can be there for other people. But it's what happens next. I think sometimes we have issues with because we tend to see this whole as a temporary inconvenience, right? That life is moving along smoothly all by yourself and then you trip and fall in a hole and someone helps you out and then you're back to normal again. That this, this otherwise healthy, capable, independent person is experiencing a little bit of trouble and I'll get them out and move on. Job's friends get a lot of credit in the verses we read, right? They show up, they sit with him, they do what they're supposed to, but then they spend the next 30 chapters of that book trying to pull him out of this hole. They tell him to buck up and get over it. They make excuses for his pain. They try to justify it. They bend over backwards to explain it away. They are really terrible friends for the rest of the book <laughs> because they're trying to get Job back to where he was before, which was a person who didn't need them. And that's our problem too. We think this hole should be temporary. We climb down in it when our neighbor is hurting and we bring our casseroles and we bring our empathy, but we act like they're climbing gear and ropes and ladders to pull them out. We want to dig them out and escape the hole because we don't like human frailty. We don't like vulnerability. We don't we're not comfortable with need, with being incomplete, and we want to change that. But the thing is, we're also already in the hole. We may not notice it right now. We may not feel like a hole. But it's always there. Not just when we're feeling particularly alone or in trouble. It's always around us. And that's what Sarah, from the story at the beginning, that's what Sarah had to learn. It's the reality that we all have to face, is that we live in this hole. We are not complete, even when we feel like we can be self-sufficient. We're not. That's not how we were designed to live. We don't have everything we need to live the way we want all on our own. We have to depend on other people. We have to admit our weaknesses. We have to be okay failing sometimes, because that's who we are. That's how God designed us that we cannot be alone. We need each other. And any attempt to do anything different is going to end up in disaster eventually, even if it seems to be working out okay for you right now. And so the big question that I was given this week to deal with, what do you need, I think is one we ask a lot, but 
our society is sort of trained us not to answer honestly. We might say, oh, I'm here to help. Let me know if you need anything. What can I do for you? But they tend to be polite inquiries where we don't really want a response. Sort of like when we say, hi, how are you? We don't expect someone to tell us how they are. And maybe some of us here do, right? Maybe we are very genuine when we ask those questions or when we offer help that we would follow through on that. I don't doubt that at all. But sincerity is not the point. It's our expectation. We have to ask these questions without the expectation that our help will solve their problems. We can't offer care and concern with the intention of fixing this person. We've got to camp down in the hole with them and be prepared to settle in for the long haul. It's not a repair job. This is the natural state of humans being in community. If it feels like we're not in a hole at the moment, it's because someone is loving and caring for us in spite of our inadequacies. They're making up for our failures. They're helping us to feel more complete, even though we aren't. I think we're reluctant to answer some of those questions truthfully when people ask because we receive them as a kind of condemnation. How can I help you? Sounds like, why is something wrong with you? What will it take for you to be different? We, we hear that as, how can I get you back to normal? When normal is not someplace we actually ever lived. Normal is vulnerable. It is weak. It is imperfect. It's relying on other people. It's not self-sufficiency. And I think perhaps if we were confident the people we talked to would be willing to sit with us indefinitely in our little hole, we'd be more willing to be honest and vulnerable in those moments. Because the reality is we are all broken people. We are incomplete on our own because we are made that way. And it might feel like love and sympathy and friendship fixes our problems, but it's just how we were designed to be, giving and receiving love, needing and having our needs met. We are knit together by the power of love the same way that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are knit together. We are created to be this way, not because we're capable or sufficient or complete on our own, but because we're capable and sufficient and complete when we are together in the name of our Lord. Amen. And as is the practice in this congregation, which I will not live down forgetting earlier this year, we have a time for response and discussion and reactions. What do you think? One of the lessons the pandemic taught us was that, that the isolation was the worst uh, effect of, of that. Going crazy, kind of just you know, alone in your house, even if they can zoom on and telephone and text and all that, and that it's just that, that body next to you. But then when my cousin's husband died, I Called her up a few months later and was just talking with her. I said, Well, when do you see me most? And, I said, and she said, In the morning, when we would just sit and read the paper together. I said, Oh, well, you know, did you do the puzzle together or something? She said, No, just having somebody next to you. We didn't even talk, but we just both drank coffee and read the paper. And that's what I really missed the most. And so that surprised me. She said, no, just having that, that body next to you. It reminds me of my little dog now, too. Just, just wants to be next to you. You know, just, just snuggles right up to you. And, you know, she wants it. I want it. It's, it's lovely. The dogs don't try to pretend they're not pack animals. And, and, they, and they're not demanding at all. Right? And they're not really so Um, we have neighbors in our previous house whose teenage son really struggled with his own mental health. And one evening, um, actually made an attempt on his own life. And our neighbors, um, the parents, the, the dad was gone. He was working in another state, and so our neighbor, the mom, 
was home alone that evening with her son who needed immediate medical care and her younger daughter who was elementary school age. And she knocked on our door and we were already friendly, we were neighbors, but in that moment, she just needed someone to stay home with her daughter so she could go with her son to the hospital. And of course we said, of course we'll do that. And I, I think maybe she would never have someone in her life who was willing to just immediately step in and be there. So again, we were already friendly, we were neighbors, but that was the moment that our whole relationship changed. I can, I can look at that evening as the turning point to a really deep and rich friendship and feeling like family for each other. And I think it's because in that deep, dark hole, she found someone who wanted to sit with her. And we also then knew more about them. We were able in that moment to know who they were as people. So as terrible as that was, I'm sure, for her son and for her and the whole family, it was a very powerful thing for our friendship. And it was a lesson I learned that if we can sit with people in those moments, I think it can be so beneficial for all of us just to really see each other as human beings. I'm thankful for that. You know. Describing that, the whole I'm thinking of, like I, what, I, what I'm thinking of is you know, some some artist that you, you know, you're looking at the world and then you, you take a step back and you see a bigger picture. Like people are in holes, but then like there's a bigger hole, so big right? You know, so, um, to spin it around a little bit, I was thinking, like, in my path, I feel like part of my growth has been figuring out what I need in order to ask for it because if you don't know what you need, also I spent a lot of part of my life guessing what other people needed and trying to give it all to them without really looking inward to see like what do you need right now? Um and to be able to to identify like what I need and who is a good person to ask that of. If you want to ask somebody that we're going to get the, you know, um, to be able to kind of take control and be victimized by feeling like they're in the hole and everybody's walking by, I guess. So, we're not taught to do that either in our society, to think about what we need. Right. We treat everything sort of as an emergency or a trauma, but we feel like I don't have this one. Right. We don't think about it. I also have a very dear friend who, when I call and I'm in my chair, that's safe. She always says, and I've used it, she'll say, What do you need right now? Like, what do you need to do right now? What's the very next step? What's going to help you? And that helps focus because a lot of times we think about the future or worrying about something today and then And that's what they like to do. We need to go to bed, we need to go to walk, we need to eat something. Sleep, you know, okay, so. so thank you. It was very thoughtful. Like we did a great job explaining all our faults. <laughs> 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 and all the things that we, we we should be doing and we don't do. And so if I mean it's 
can't help but feel like you're guilty of this. Yeah. I'm like, I'm guilty of it. But I, I've had time to spend with my daughter and my granddaughter, and I've watched a daughter who is not her mother, her granddaughter, <laughs> and uh, say to her, What do you need? Like when Sarah calls from school and she's frantic because things are not going well, and she's struggling and, and she has no parents but she has when and when we ask the right questions and even though I'm unable to do that she is <laughs> one of the biggest challenges in my life was coming to grips with the fact that I can't be any different than I am right now. Maybe I could have made different decisions that led to a different point, but where I am now I can't be any other place than where I am. Just being comfortable with that and being able to admit it. Is an extent. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for such a thorough analysis of this. I appreciate that very much. I think that I worry about that, I think you feel guilty about it. And uh, that's why I'm about to overdo my guilt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that when you encounter people who are so almost permanently in the hole, yeah. they sort of need everything. And uh, and they, they, they need so many things that it's difficult for them to specify what they need right now. Yeah. And that and then can I give what they need? You now I've got to recognize the fact that I, I cannot. Yeah. I can do some things for them, but I cannot do all the things. Then I'm never quite sure whether I'm just sort of protecting myself at that point. And the question, what, what, what is my responsibility for a person who needs everything? Well, I don't want to cut anyone else off, but that's a really great transition to kind of where we're moving next, is that we're going to be singing Be Thou My Vision, yeah. which is my favorite hymn. Yeah. And the reason it is my favorite hymn is because it is a reminder that the world does not depend on us, right? <laughs> That God will continue to work and God will accomplish everything God is doing, regardless of whether we join in. I was thinking about that this week as a good pastor. Brooke was constantly texting me this week to make sure I had what I needed and everything was going to go well. And I remember being a younger pastor and feeling the same way that everything is on you to make sure that it's going to happen. And a, a wise older mentor reminded me that the people of God will gather and they will praise the Lord. And worship will happen, regardless of whether you're there or not, um, because God is good, and uh, we can trust him. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art, thou my best love, I Be thou 
joys, O oh bright heaven sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befalls, still be my vision, O oh ruler of all. thank God for the vision. If you join with me in our confession time, again, you can read the bold together and I'll read plain text. How many of you have ever had a bad day and found someone offering you unsolicited advice? How many of you have ever had a bad week and had someone rush in with dozens of suggestions for how you might fix things as if you hadn't thought of that before? We have all been there and we have all done that. Our scripture reminds us today that often in the face of hurt, what people really need is not a list of advice or solutions, but the simple presence of love. So let us pray to God today, acknowledging that we are works in progress and that relationships always come with mistakes and confessions. Let us pray together. Gracious God, sometimes life feels like cooking with flour. It looks like it should be easy, but we always make a mess. This is particularly true when it comes to our relationships. We so desperately long to say the right thing, to be the right thing, to find the right solution that we overstep the line. Forgive us for assuming the place you fall. Forgive us for imagining that we, in all our humanity, could possibly fix all the hurt in this world. Instead, give us the grace and the strength to stand by our loved ones in their moments of need, to witness their hurt without trying to fix it. You are God. We are not. Teach us how to be a friend. Teach us how to ask, what do you need? Teach us how to point to you gratefully. And hear these words of assurance. Family of faith, no matter how many times you have spoken without listening, assumed without knowing, offered without asking, or rushed without waiting, you are forgiven. God knows your desire and your intent. God knows when we try and miss the mark, and God surrounds us in grace. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. Every day is a new day for love. We are claimed. We are forgiven. We are invited into relationship. Thanks be to God for growth and grace that know no end. One of the things I love most about the church is that on our hardest days and our longest nights, we are never alone. Job needed his friends. Paul needed Timothy. Jesus needed the disciples. We need each other. So today you are invited to the table. But know that you are not invited alone. You, your neighbor, your family, your friends, and those you haven't met are all invited. Look around. Or just listen. Look around. There is something special here. We need each other, and we are all invited together. So come to the table. You are not alone. As we receive from God, we also offer ourselves. If you should feel led to give your offering here in person rather than online, we have uh, a basket here, and you can bring it forward as you receive the bread and the cup. When you give, you are not only supporting this congregation, but offering care to the broader community. In these small acts of care, connection, and love that in time can help heal and hurt the world. Heal some hurt in the world. I feel an hurt the world. God of the here and now, my oh my, how we need you. This world seems to turn upside down all the time. Our center of gravity feels off. In moments like these, we are particularly grateful for the care you offer and the stability of friends. 
So today we say a prayer of thanks for the people in our life who take the time to ask, genuinely, what do you need? Gracious God, help us to be those people for others. Give us the eyes to see when our neighbors are in need and the wisdom to ask, what do you need? Stop our assumptions cold in their tracks and instead heart out a space in us to listen. We are practicing breathing deeply. We are practicing being still. We are practicing sitting with our pain and honoring it. We are practicing saying what we need and not being afraid to ask for help. We turn now to the life of Jesus who spent his life meeting the needs of those he encountered. Throughout his life, he approached pain by stopping and listening. That commitment was often opposed, eventually leading to his death. On the night of his arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his unlikely disciples. In community, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to all of them, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Take, eat, and remember me. After the supper, he did the same with the cup, saying, This is a symbol of the new covenant. Drink in remembrance of me. So gather us in and hold us close. Be with us in our waiting and in our praying. Be with us in our grief and our sorrow. Be in our relationships that we might be blessed with friends who support us and that we might be the friends who can bless others. Be with us in this meal that it might remind us that we are never alone, that you are always coming quickly to our side, sitting with us in pain and drawing us together as a community. With deep gratitude and true humility, we say, welcome to come forward.
kindly old eyes Shattered and broken The curse of sin's tyranny My life is hidden Neath heaven's shadow Your crimson blood covers me because you are in it, you are not responsible to keep it spinning. Amen. Yeah, the wild, 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 the wild